I thought I might stay down here, you know, because standing up there is a bit ridiculous. It's really like, you know, some kind of cathedral. Um, I wasn't quite sure how many people would come. I decided that this is probably a lecture. If only half of you had come, it would be a seminar. And if only two had come, we'd had a tutorial. And if only one came, we'd go and have a drink. You know, I thought that... Uh, but I'm going to try and... Uh, <clears throat> try and talk. I, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat because... Uh, uh, flying from Australia to Europe is always a challenge. Um, so you'll excuse me if I sound a bit croaky. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I can control these, uh, these slides from down here, so we're, we don't need to go up on this uh, podium. Okay. What I want to talk about today is really about professional and organizational communication, but across a whole range of different kinds of professions and organizations, of which, of course, language teaching and learning is one, and, of course, language teaching and learning interfaces with a whole range of other kinds of professions and organizations, for example, in business or in science or in uh, social work or in health or whatever, and law. And so, really, I'm talking about an integration of issues to do with communication, but also issues to do with uh, professional and organizational working life. And I'd ask you to try to <clears throat> think about what I'm going to be saying really on two kinds of level. One kind of level is, as it were, above the particular domains. In other words, not seeing things in a narrow domain way, but seeing things in an overarching kind of way. And the other, of course, is to look in detail at some themes which are, again, across domain, and how we can look at how these can be researched and how they can be taught um, in terms of, um, of actual practice. And as you can see from the title, I'm going to be talking about three particular themes, one of risk, one of trust, and one of strategy, and in relation to professional communication. And the paper, the, the talk is divided really into three parts. <clears throat> the first is to do with the background, the current shifts, because there are enormous shifts going on now, as we all know, in the social order. And the social order is perhaps more dynamic at the present time than it has ever been. And it's really a question about how we as professionals concerned with communication can accommodate and adjust ourselves to the actual dynamic, rather than being frozen, so to speak, in a world of verities and of fast and hard boundaries which really don't, um, uh, don't occur anymore, if indeed they ever did. But we're certainly living in a, in a much more dynamic world. And the first section then is some background. And <clears throat> I'm talking about developing what I've called a mission-directed research and practice in applied linguistics. The idea that we can develop an applied linguistics of professions alongside the kinds of sociology of professions or the anthropology of professions that one can find in other disciplinary areas. And what I think characterizes this, um, if you like, mission-directed research is a fundamental shift in focus from professional communication seen as a register or a genre of texts towards professional communication seen more as an expert system and at the same time accommodating a more involved fieldwork-based collaborative enterprise. The argument being then, if you take, for example, a classroom, a classroom is simply not a collection of texts. 
A classroom is, if you like, a living system in which the people who are involved in this classroom are engaged systematically in various shifts and changes of role and relationship in a highly dynamic way. And to somehow characterize that as a transcript of an interaction and then look at it as it were divorced from that particular dynamic context as something which can be analyzed as it were out of the context of use in some sort of generic structure way or whatever seems to me to make very little sense. I don't think it ever made very much sense, but it certainly doesn't make very much sense now. Now if we take that role or take that uh, line, then I think what we have to do is to find ways of incorporating what we might call the descriptive, the linguistic and semiotic study of quote-unquote texts. And these texts, of course, are not just written texts. They're now increasingly multimodal texts of all, of all sorts. And the interpretive and ethnographic and cultural study of interactions and the explanatory and, if you like, the interventionist or professional collaborative study of what I call focal themes, which I'll come back to later, and in a context of system change, in particular what uh, Ron Scullin calls sites, sites of engagement. So that's really part of the background of what I want to talk about. Now, if we start to try and chart the field, what are the current issues in communication in the context of professions and organizations? And here I think we have to stand back from our particular interests, be it, for example, in a classroom, or be it, for example, in training in the workplace, or in consulting, or counseling, or whatever it might be. We need to step back from that and, we re and look generally at the fact <coughs> that there are now increasingly officially sponsored calls for better communication abilities among professional workers with an accompanying move towards a client-centered relationship building emphasizing communication skills training. You only have to look at the advertisements for jobs or you only have to look at the way in which companies or organizations of all kinds promote themselves in terms of what they are requiring of their employees or demanding, as it were, of their workers. And central to that is a heightened communicative ability. You can see it simply be by doing an inspection of advertisements and so on, or a checking into what organizations are asking. And this development then of a calls for better communication and the notion of client-centered relationship building, emphasizing communication skills training, takes place in a context of the assessment, if you like, or the appraisal of the degree of communicative expertise people have in terms of how they meet emergent problems in dealing with uncertainties associated with planning and action. So if you look at the way in which people's performances are, are valued or their performances are appraised, then increasingly these performances are appraised in terms of people's communicative expertise in dealing with a whole raft of issues and challenges that arise from the workplace of whatever kind. And language teaching, of course, as well as any other area, is um, part of that. At the same time, one can say that there's a highly increasing level of, of consumer and client literacy with ease of access to websites requiring providers and partners to reinterpret what clients already know and to distill relevance from essentially relational narratives. What I mean by that is that we are now increasingly becoming or required to become literate in terms of accessing websites where the providers and the partners, if you like, are involved in reinterpreting what we already know in different ways in new kinds of circumstances. And so our skills now are how we can, as it were, distill personal relevance from these narratives which are told in all manner of, um, of um, uh, mediated environments. And of course, linked to that is the technologization of communication is displaying, uh, displacing old ways of doing, saying, and writing and requiring new ones. Now my assumption, or rather my suspicion, is perhaps that we recognize this. We couldn't fail to recognize this. The question, are we drawing the conclusions from it, 
in terms of the kinds of strategies and skills that people need to have as part of their communicative repertoire, as part of their expertise. And equally, if we are the providers, if you like, of information, how is it that we adjust the way in which we provide this, into this information multimodally so as to link and connect with the audiences that we are dealing with? And that's whether it's an audience of kids, as it were, highly competent in SMS messaging, or whether we're dealing with huge organizations that are, as it were, communicating with each other and with the public in a whole variety of novel, um, of novel ways. Now, what challenges then do... Sorry, I think that's gone down. So I think we've, I think I've lost one. Oh, no, sorry, I haven't. Okay, so what kinds of transformations then um, occur in terms of customer client service delivery and the so-called partnerships? Here I think what we need to do is to look at the organization. And it doesn't really matter whether the organization is a school or a factory or a hospital or a social work um, institution or a police station, whatever it is. If we look at these um, organizations, what we're seeing is a shift from hierarchical bureaucracies where relationships are essentially transactional. People tell things, people to do, to do this or that or require them, as it were, to respond to this or that. And where the professions are tightly connected into guilds, as it were. A shift from that into team and network-based communities, fluid interactional relationships, boundary crossing, negotiative environments in where the relationships of role and knowledge, as it were, are not fixed but are constantly shifting and changing, interactions which are increasingly communicatively rich rather than rather simple transactional um, uh, exchanges of information and response, if you like, we're living in a world which is constantly appraised and audited. I don't know about your world, but my world is totally audited. When I think of how I began teaching in you know, institutions and universities in the good old days where there was a kind of freedom of action, it simply isn't the case. I live in a highly controlled and audited environment, and this naturally has an effect on the nature of the communication that I have to be com competent in, and also the kinds of communication that I have in some way to respond to. And this auditing culture, of course, is married to an equally powerful market and outcome-driven service culture, where it is, as it were, our ability to deliver goods via communication skills of one sort or another is increasingly at a premium. It's not uninteresting to notice that if you look at the competency, competency, competency statements of fields like accountancy or law or medicine or nursing or social work or teaching and so on, if you look at the competency statements, very high in the competency statement is the ability to communicate. But actually, when you press it, there's very little information about what exactly that communicative ability is. So it's rather good and comforting to know that at least in Australia, the top competency for accountants is the ability to manage financial statements. That's rather comforting. But the second one is their ability to communicate. If you look at the competency statements of civil engineers <coughs> in Australia, and I'm sure this is true everywhere else, again, it's comforting to know that the top competency is applied physics so that the bridge doesn't fall down. But if you look at the second competency, it's a communicative competency. And if you press that, it turns out that that communicative competency means the ability of talking to clients who may know nothing about engineering at all, the ability to communicate with public authorities whose permission has to be gained in order for the bridge or so to be approved in the first place, then generally to the public to say, well, look, what might seem to them to be atrociously atrocious bridge from a visible point of view, in fact, is the latest word in urban design. And this is the kind of communicative abilities which are required of profession after profession. And teaching is no different from any other kind of profession in this respect. 
So we are, as it were, living in this very dynamic, fluid, and different kind of communicative world. So what kinds of challenges do these shifts raise for professional and organizational communication research and action? <clears throat> what I think it does is that these texts of all kinds, these multimodal semiotic codings and interactions, in these relational communication events, if you like, they evidence transitional, heterogeneous, and hybrid forms of communication practices. So that if you look, for example, <coughs> at a day in the life of an accountant, or a day in the life of a teacher, or the day in the life of a health worker, or the day in the life of the lawyer, or whatever it is, and you map, as it were, the transactions and interactions that that person undertakes in the day, you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed at the hybridity of the roles, for example, that they play. On the one hand, more informational giving, on the other, more counseling, on the other, more, um, if you like, negotiative, on the other hand, more um, ones which are interrogatory of other people's practices. So the day in the life of a particular professional worker is highly dynamic, transitional, heterogeneous, and hybrid. And if you live in a multicultural society and a multilingual society like I am, then it simply exacerbates that in terms of that um, <coughs> complexity. It's also clear the transformations in institutionality, how institutions are organized, how they're, govern how they're governed, and of course professional practices, this reveals organizational tensions and ambiguities. We're not always all on the same page. We're not, as it were, all in the same boat. We're actually in a whole range of different boats, and in any kind of organization, there are contested discourses. So if you say to somebody, well, what do teachers do? And they say, well, you know, teachers, teachers teach. But then if you ask them, well, what does it actually mean? And how would you define teaching? Then you find, in fact, that there is a multiplicity of different definitions, ranging from perhaps a more didactic, a more authoritarian, and so on, to a more a more inclusive, a more um, uh, counseling-like kind of interaction. But then you might say, well, if this teacher says that I counsel my students, how does this relate to people who are professionally counselors? Is it the same or is it different? And so the labeling, as it were, of these professional actions, all of which, all of which are mediated through and in fact partly defined by their communicative nature, what that does is to show that we're living not in a peaceful world. We're living in a world which is full of contest, tension, ambiguity. And the only way in which, and these tensions and ambiguities and so on are revealed through communicative performance, but they're also unlockable through analyses of communicative performance. We operate on the assumption that people simply do not talk arbitrarily. People always talk purposefully. The question is what the purpose is, and how do we find that out? And how is a one purpose masked by another? But the idea of people as you're wandering around the globe, speaking and uttering in a kind of nonce-like way is simply not the case. And as we define what the nature of this purposiveness in communication is, then we begin to reveal the nature of this kind of complexity and hybridity. Now, if you add into this mix, as it were, a world which is increasingly a migrant world. I mean, I live in a country which is entirely migrant. But migration is now a fact of life. In fact, it's a very dangerous for many people fact of life. But the increasing cultural diversity among providers and patients and clients impacts on issues of intelligibility and interpretability, and they're not the same. It's not the same as it were to understand somebody from an intelligible point of view and to understand somebody from an interpretive point of view. We may, as it were, decode the lexicogramma or decode the phonology, but that doesn't mean to say that we can understand in Miller's sense of believing what the interpretation value is of that particular utterance. If we're going to get into that, then what we have to develop is not simply a kind of communicative ability 
of a contemporary kind, we have, as it were, to understand the rich historical and contextual sensitivities that we need to have in order to understand that. People come from different places. People are always transiting from one place to another, and they have a history. One of my favorite writers on uh, research practice <coughs> is a man called Leder who wrote a book in 1993 called New Directions or New Strategies in Social Research. And quite central to that is the idea of history. So that when one goes into a classroom and you see this teacher or teachers and you see these students or pupils or whatever they are, or if you go to a training environment in a factory or a company, or indeed if you've got the, one of my students at the moment is working on the communicative analysis of a w factory in South Sydney, which is sort of Italian, Australian and so on. If you go into that kind of environment, then what one needs to do is to have the tools which would enable us, as it were, to unpack the complexities of that communication. And you can't do that if you don't take a historical and also, of course, a social structural understanding of what that factory is or what that classroom is, where these teachers come from, where these kids come from. And in a migrant society where there is an increasing interculturality, that simply increases the demand on our community of ability. So it requires historical and contextual sensitivity on the part of communication researchers and practitioners. By the way, if anyone wants these slides, I mean, I'm quite happy to send them to you. Just send me an email and I'll send it to you. We weren't quite sure how many people would come, so I didn't print you know, the handouts, but I will certainly can let you have them. Okay. Given that, what then are the key issues for research and practice? Now I'm talking about us as researchers and practitioners, and I interconnect the two. I dislike this boundary drawing between researchers and practitioners. Any practitioner, as anyone who's read the work of Donald Schoen knows, any practitioner is in fact a researcher in her own environment. And so we're talking about research and practice, or praxis, if you like, as interconnected. So we have to ask these questions. What knowledge can we bring to bear on our understanding of other professional practices? What do we know about those practices? How can our research practices be informed by the personal knowledge of professional practitioners with whom we work? Wouldn't it be a good idea if one was trying to analyze communication in a classroom or in a hospital to not go in there with a preconceived idea about what communication is or a preconceived model in one's head about how one's going to analyze it, but wouldn't it be a good idea if we just went in there and did nothing but just listen, you know, walk around, sniff around, see what's going on, find out by listening, rather than going in there and say, oh, it's a classroom, right, this is what we do. Now, we've done a lot of that and it's not helpful. What I think we need to do is to strike alliances with professionals because in my experience those professionals have an acute understanding of the nature of communication. They live it every day and they're able to talk about it of course and to rationalize about it and to talk about it in a kind of as it were objective quote unquote way but not necessarily in our language. So we have two choices or rather three. They learn our language or we learn their language, or somehow we work together and we find out a language which we both can understand and use it, as it were, to interpret the communicative environment in which both they and us are going to be working. And I think, of course, the latter is the best way to go. So how can we access these knowledge and belief systems of professional practitioners? Several years ago, <coughs> a very good um, couple of colleagues of mine in Finland Ansi Parakala and Per Vechvilainen wrote a very interesting paper for one of our journals on what they call stocks of interactional knowledge, SIKS. And what they said is that any professional person, or indeed any person, but any particular professional person, has built within herself stocks of interactional knowledge. It's what she knows about the world in which she works. Now, she rarely has to declare this because in the world in which she works, this is shared by other people. And you don't have to read Grice to know that you don't tell people things they already know. So 
The fact is that this is a mutuality which is taken for granted and needs not to be articulated. But if you drop into this little mutual pool some sort of strange element, like, for example, a researcher who doesn't belong to that, then it's necessary to try to unpack and reveal what these stocks of interactional knowledge are. And what they mean is that we are all accustomed to behave interactionally in particular ways in our environment, and we simply have developed this in a kind of Bordivian sort of habitus. We've developed this as part and parcel of our professional life. And so we have to find a way of how to unlock that and how people can reflexively make, make aware or make visible or make known what Argyris calls tacit knowledge and what Vakulainen and Perakele call stocks of interactional knowledge. So how can we accent? Now, <clears throat> the other question, of course, is the so what question number four. Presumably we're undertaking research not just to get degrees and not just to put theses on shelves, but to make some kind of practical action, to give some, make some change in practical action. It seems to me that if you're in applied linguistics, you're committed to practical action. The question is, how can we, as it were, achieve some actions with our professional partners, as it were, which can claim this idea or claim this prize, so to speak, of practical relevance? And then, of course, the fifth question, which really imbues them all, is what can be learned by making the communication researcher practitioner part of the professional inquiry process? Very easy to say, of course, but not so easy, actually, to, to achieve. So, in a kind of summary, then, what are the key constructs <coughs> in researching professional and organizational communication? Well, the first, interact the first um, key construct is what we might call interactions, what Scotland calls the nexus of practice, where we're explaining what I've called critical moments in crucial sites of inter- and intra-professional encounters. A very typical teaching environment for, environment for me in Sydney is I come into a class and there's a range of people like yourselves, and I say, look, can you just tell me what you do? And that's an odd question. What do you mean, what do I do? And I said, well, you know, what do you get paid for? What do you do? And so one person says, well, you know, I work in a clinic. Another one says, well, actually, I'm an insolvency practitioner in an accounting firm. Another person says, well, I engage in counseling with teenage children, teenage young people, and so on. We go around the room. And what immediately strikes you is differentiation, heterogeneity. But then I say to them, look, think for a moment of sites in your world which for you are crucial sites from a communicative point of view, where, which challenge your ability, which challenge your understanding, which challenge, as it were, your knowledge of the world in which you work. What are these crucial sites? Just write them down. And then I say to them, okay, choose one or two of those crucial sites and I want you to identify critical moments in these crucial sites where you're really, as it were, on the line in terms of communicating. So, for example, somebody who works in, in um, healthcare might say, well, a crucial site for me is when I'm actually having to deal with somebody who has some terminal illness, and the critical moment is when I have to somehow break the bad news that this critical illness is not, as it were, something that's going to be palliatively ameliorated by our medical knowledge. And then the accountant says, oh, that's interesting. Crucial side for me, you know, is when I'm in a firm and I'm doing auditing and I realize that they don't just want me to audit, but they want me actually to cook the books in some way so that the figures look better than they actually are. And so this is a challenge I never thought about that. Accountants have to deal with that. And then you suddenly realize around the room that there is a great parallelism and the crucial sites laminate on top of each other, and people say, oh, that's interesting. And you have that? And then the critical moments then come forward, and the challenges to their communicative ability become quite shared. Breaking bad news is not just something that happens in a palliative care clinic. Pa uh, breaking bad news applies a whole, across a whole range. Do you see what I mean? 
So we're dealing already now with the idea that there are themes or instances or incidents or moments which are supra-domain, which are supra-organizational. And it's recognized as such by the participants. And so after about two hours of this, I suddenly find that a group of people who started off being heterogeneous are now a group which has a great community of interest. And so the idea that this heterogeneity means that it's impossible to talk to them, as it were, as a group, is simply not true. So the second construct, then, is modality. How we manage the integration and displaying of multiple semiotic forms. It creeps on you a bit quiet-like, this ability to handle multimodality. People don't recognize the multimodal skills that they've somehow developed because they haven't been taught it in a formal sense. I mean, they may have learnt it from their kids or something, but this ability is something which they have, to an extent, gradually acquired. Not all, of course, and not all to the same degree. It also becomes quite important what people's experiences are. The narratives of self and identity become very important. So telling stories is not, as it were, some kind of sort of qualitative mishmash, it's actually essential to the understanding of identity. We have a big, big one-day conference on the 9th of November in, um, uh, in Sydney where some of the people working strongly in the area of identity, Daphina, Rampton and others, um, we have a whole day looking at this whole question of how narratives of experience tell us things about identity. At the same time, a key construct is organizational conditions. This, of course, has been a mainstay of sociological analysis for decades, for a hundred and hundreds of years, this idea of the relationship between the macro social order and the micro interactional order. But if you look at the work of people like Sicarell, for example, where quite in a conscious way, the relationship is made between the organizational structure what you might call the macro order, and the actual interactions in the classroom. So, give me, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> if you operate within a managed healthcare system, as we do in Victoria in Australia, where particular treatments are accorded particular times, so if you have treatment number X, then you're paid, as it were, or the institution is paid by the government a certain sum of money for the doing of that, treating of that condition within a particular time frame. Okay, fine. Averaged, obviously. What happens if your patient is a psychogeriatric patient who comes not from Australia but from the Bekaa Valley in the Lebanon, and she's in Melbourne, and she goes into the hospital, and the doctor has to treat her? You can't treat them in 10 minutes. And so the institutional order pressures the doctor to change his interaction order into one which becomes possibly quite against his will, an interaction order of question and response, question and response, question and response, not one of developing a kind of negotiation with the patient. So the institutional order has a direct effect on the interaction order. Now, if the interaction order constrained in this way becomes in some sense the norm, then the interaction order reinforces the institutional order. And a change and a shift, as it were, is correspondingly much more difficult because it's become locked in. It's been frozen in to a relationship. And this is true of teaching. It's true of any kind of institutional practice. Wherever you go, it's always a good idea in this kind of line of work to go to informal environments like the staff room in a school or the coffee bar in a hospital or the relaxation room in some sort of institution. And if you go to those kinds of places and keep your eyes and ears open, what emerges is a repetitive set of focal themes which condition, in some sense, the behaviors and communication of the people with whom you're working. Teachers talk about the same kinds of things. They complain about the same kinds of things. 
they praise the same kinds of things, rather less, of course. Then you go into a factory, the same is true. You go into a business, the same is true. These are written about in newsletters. They're highlighted as being issues which we talk about. They're focal themes, and we'll talk about some of them in a moment. These constitute, if you like, the, the central features of communication from a content perspective in any kind of um, environment. Now, if there are these focal themes, because we're researchers, because we're interested in communication, because we're interested in language, we need to have at our disposal a toolbox of methodologies, which we can call, if you like, analytic themes. And we need to match, as it were, this toolbox of methodologies to the particular focal themes with which we're dealing. So, in summary then, there are really, if you like, four macro constructs that we've been talking about. On the one hand, the notion of communities of practice, people who adhere to the same kinds of goals, as it were, recognize the same kinds of methodologies, as it were, share, as it were, the same interpretive procedures, the modes of communicating. Crucial sites within these communities of practice, critical moments within these crucial sites, and a set of strategic processes which people have, as it were, developed over time as part of their communicative ability. And as far as interaction is concerned, we're involved always, we're involved always with three, I think, kinds of world. A professional world, that is to say the guild, if you like, that we belong to, what we got our degrees in, what labels we have, what we call ourselves. What are you? I'm a teacher. What are you? I'm a doctor. What are you? I'm an accountant. This is a professional identity. But then organizationally, we have, as it were, a place within that. For example, that you are a master teacher, or you're a head teacher, or you're a foreperson, or you're a police sergeant, or whatever it might be. And then we have, as it were, interpersonal discourses between these professions and organizations. Speaking like a police sergeant, I would tell you. But talking to you like a friend, I would say so-and-so. So our interpersonal relationships change, in a sense, the um, kind of rather more fixed, perhaps, professional and organizational positionings that we occupy even within this dynamic world. So if we want to summarize, and this is the first and longer part of this talk, what are the key constructs and questions? Okay, the constructs identity, who's engaged, and what are their roles? These are the questions, I think, that we need to ask ourselves as any kind of researcher working in this area. Agency, who is responsible for what goes on and to what degree? Participation, who's involved and in what ways and why? Transparency, how open and ethically, ethically do people work? Reasoning, in what terms do people make a case? One of the most interesting areas at the moment is this notion of reasoning. How professionals reason are not the same as how lay people reason. And what professionals constantly have to do is to transform the lay reasoning of their patients or their clients into, into matters which they as professionals can understand and then to retransform that back into a discourse which is understandable by the um, lay person. A typical site for this, of course, would where we have parent-teacher meetings. Okay? I go along, I don't now go along because I'm a bit old, but my daughter goes along with her ch sons to a parent-teacher meeting. And they're talking about Harry or they're talking about Mary and there's the teacher and the parent. But the teacher is a professional person and argues, as it were, and reasons in a professional way. The mother or the father is not a professional person in that sense, therefore reasons and argues in a rather different and lay way. And in order to avoid their talking past each other, which frequently happens, what has to happen is that there is a transformation process both ways. The professional transforms the lay argument and reasoning into terms that the professional can understand and then plays it back and vice versa. 
And of course, as parents become more knowledgeable, of course not entirely knowledgeable, but they become knowledgeable, you get a blurring of the relationship between the professional and the lay, which in fact increases the complexity of that kind of communication. Now that's true in a school, and it's also true in any kind of organizational environment in which you might be. How open and ethically do people work? The assumption, of course, is that people are open and they are working in an ethical manner. In fact, of course, it's very often not like that at all. People have particular reasons, purposes, and so on that, as it were, are not open to the kind of transparency. Things are not always as they seem. Therefore, we need, from a researching point of view, to try and dig in that, dig into that. Reasoning I've talked about. Expertise. <clears throat> Ask yourself the question, how do you know whether the person that you work for is an expert or not? If you're a teacher, for example, how do you know whether your fellow teachers are experts? How would you work that out? If you're flying in an aeroplane, you hope to God that the pilot's an expert, otherwise you're in deep trouble. And on the whole, the people are. And how are they expert? Because they, they live in a defined kind of environment in which people understand what the conventional rules are for communication, and they don't deviate left or right. But in other kinds of environment, it may be rather difficult to determine what the nature of this expertise is, yet we rely in a sense on it. And then finally, reflexivity, that is to say, to what extent do the participants, um, to what extent are the participants, if you like, aware of what um, they are expert in? So what are the underlying principles that we're really drawing upon? Bourdieu made the statement once that the point of view is inseparable from what is viewed. In other words, we all see things in different ways. If Gabby comes into a classroom in which um, somebody's teaching and if I come into a classroom where somebody's teaching, we don't see it in the same way. We see it according to our own particular perspective, our own motivational relevances. She sees what she wants to see, I see what I want to see, and they're not the same. And so we can't say then that the perspective that people have will be, if you like, overlapping and identical. Of course, they won't be totally different, but they will, as it were, be varied according to the motivational relevance, that is to say, what it is that we have as a point of view. An underlying principle is that discourse is, if you like, an offers a window into this notion of understanding professional assumptions and work. And if that's true, we need to be able to describe data, we need to be able to interpret what people say, but above all, we need to be able to explain what people say and not say. Why do they say it? Why don't they say it? What's the reason for this? So it's not just describing it with all of our linguistic tools. It's not just giving interpretations of it. It's giving explanations of it in terms of the historical, structural, institutional background that infuses what goes on. We can say that professional practice is essentially based on knowledge, but always other-oriented. So there's self-knowledge, and there's this other orientation. Given the complexities that I've been talking about, then what we need is an equally complex set of what I've called interdiscursive methodologies. And the maxim that um, Srikant Sarangi and I have, which I've tried to put on our, t on our computer, is focus on the site, not the model. Don't go in there saying, oh, well, we're going to sort this out with systemic functional linguistics. Or go in there and say, oh, we're going to sort this out with conversational analysis. Or we're going to sort this out, as it were, with content analysis. Don't do that. Go in there and say, focus on the site. What is the nature of the site? What are its crucial sites? What are its critical moments? Who are the participants? What is their history? What is their purposes? And then say, ah, what are the texts that are involved here? And then say, okay, now, let's step back and look in a bank, a toolbox of methodologies, and select those which are going to be the best for descriptive, interpretive, and explanatory purposes with the particular sets of data that we're going to work with. There is an also an important matter of researcher stance. And it sounds rather patronizing, perhaps, or even a little bit sort of uh, wan, that there is an importance of understanding, respect, and trust with the people with whom we work. In other words, to try and 
acknowledge this reflexivity and relevance that I was talking about before. Now, if we move on to this second part of what I want to say, and I want to talk for a little while about risk and trust as two interconnected and domain overarching themes in professional and organizational communication. I could have chosen others, but I am at the moment involved in working out things to do with risk and trust, so I thought I would talk about that. Okay. About 25 years ago, <coughs> a German so sociologist by the name of Beck wrote a very influential book called Die Risikogesellschaft, The Risk Society. Very influential. And it had to do with the fact that everywhere in life we are involved with risk. And everywhere in life we're involved in managing risk to more or less good or bad degree. But risk is pervasive. Associated with risk as a kind of hedge against risk, although he in the book didn't go much into that, is this notion of trust. So trust and risk are connected together. We could say, following Beck, that we live in the trust society, if you like, die Vertrauensgesellschaft in German terms. But actually, as we all know, what we live in now is not the trust society, but the mistrust society. We live, as it were, in eine Misstrauensgesellschaft. So we have a combination of what Beck, the German soci sociologist, called the risk society. And then as a counterpoint to the risk society is the idea of building a kind of trust society. But unfortunately, what happens, as it were, or has happened as a result of all kinds of changes and so on and so forth, that this establishment of trust is becoming rarer and more and more difficult to achieve. And people retreat, as you like, into a kind of mistrust society. Now, what I'm arguing is that risk is understandable in discourse terms, trust is understandable in discourse terms, and sure as heck, mistrust is understandable in, disc, uh, disc terms, uh, in discourse terms. I don't know about your life, but in my life, we're constantly working in an uncertain and turbulent context. Ones where the, the old verities are changing, as it were, in terms of relationships. And what we're trying to do, I suppose, is to try to create and maintain trust through the way in which we interact with people as a kind of hedge against risk, on the grounds that the more trustful a relationship we can develop, the less, as it were, we are subject to the vagaries of risk. Trust on the whole, people have two kinds of trust. They have trust in organizations and they have trust in people, and they're not the same. So people can vaguely, can, people can generally have trust, for example, in the healthcare service of Australia, in a general sense. But that's not the same as having interpersonal trust with particular people. And people can, can have interpersonal trust with particular people in an environment of organizational lack of trust. Happens all the time. People identify, as it were, persons with whom they can have a trusting relationship, even in an environment which is fundamentally, from their perspective, risky and untrustful. Then we can ask ourselves the question, well, how is, if you like, trust maintained through interaction? Sorry, I've, I've jumped a page again. Sorry. Now let's have a, just start not with trust but with risk. So if we have this issue of managing uncertainty and risk in turbulent contexts, we can ask the following questions. We can say, well, from whom or what and in which context is this risk environment deriving? We can look at the accountability of risk, the relationship between risk and blame. If there's a greater risk, is there less blame or greater blame? The, how is blame related to experiences of risk? How is risk a cultural category? Do Greeks, for example, understand risk in a different way than people from Japan or from other uh, cultural environment? Even if you had the same kind of context, let's, very, let's say, for example, nuclear power, <coughs> 
do different cultural groups understand the risk nature of nuclear power in the same way? Or do different cultures, as it were, define risk in a different way? What are the organizational and professional contexts of risk? Risk is always present when one's identifying problems and appraising them, because the risk might be that you do it badly, inadequately, or in plainly wrongly. Risk is involved in making and taking critical decisions. Whether you're a teacher, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a policeman, whether you're a health worker, the taking of critical decisions is always a risky business. And risk is always involved when you design and redesign systems and processes. You know that if you're working in an educational environment. If the curriculum changes or there's a mandate to change the curriculum, this becomes a very risky kind of business for these who take people who take part. If we look at trust now for a moment, then what we can say, I think, about trust is that trust is always based on choice, it's always contextualized, and it's always involved in some way with intention. Trust is therefore relational, interpersonal, and intersubjective. It's not something you can buy off a shelf. Trust is created interactionally through communication, just as distrust is. But we can, as it were, not lie back and say there's nothing we can do about this, because we can, in a conscious, strategic way, develop trust by the kinds of interaction we engage in. It's situated, it's context-dependent, and above all, as I say, it's discursively constructed. So what then are the, what are the key res recursive themes that occur when one wants to look at this super-domain idea of risk and trust? Well, the first, I think, and this is true for all kinds of research in professional and organizational communication, what one could call joint problematization. That's to say, sitting down with the practitioners with whom we wish to work and research and jointly identifying, interpreting, and explaining critical issues. The pressures of professional life, particularly in schools or universities or wherever else, militate against this. They favor the immediate. They favor the temporary. They don't favor the long term. Two years ago, I was working with a group of general practitioner trainers in Western Sydney with one of my researchers and my wife who works in health communication and a professor of general practice, University of Sydney. And we made an arrangement whereby we would work with 15 trainers of doctors over a whole year. And we would meet with them once or possibly twice a month. And we would sit in a round group and they would bring videos of their own practice and we would look at the videos and people would comment upon them. And we videoed this whole session. And over 12 months, what we developed was a mutual way of talking about these events which brought together their understandings of professional communication, our understandings of professional communication, and developed a common discourse which we could then collectively use for the understanding of these environments. What we didn't go do was to go in there and say, oh, well, what you need is, you know, half an hour of alignment, okay? And so what you're going to do is sit away and you're going to read, you know, X on alignment and Y on alignment, we'll sort it out, because alignment's the issue. You don't do that. You work, as it were, over a period of time. Srikant Sarangi, I work with a lot, over the last decade or more, has been working with people in geriatric medicine in order to try to understand, as it were, what is the nature of the counseling environment when young couples, for example, go to gen genetic counseling and say, should we have a baby? What are the chances that if we have a baby that it might have Huntington's disease? And you enter a world of, you enter a world of uncertainty. You enter a world of probability. And people say, well, you know, looking at your background, there might be I don't know, 50, 60% chance. What does that mean? So the whole environment is an environment of uncertainty and probability, which is articulated linguistically, as it were, with a whole range of, of wordings, like <coughs> almost, possibly, conceivably, could be the case, that might happen, and so on. And this is backed up by a set of statistical enumerations, 
which are by and large unintelligible to those who are not firmly involved in that kind of environment over a long period of time. And then what you discover over time working in partnership with people in geriatric, in genetic um, counseling, for example, as Srikant has found, that the nature of the interaction changes according to the condition. So genetic counseling in relation to Huntington's disease is not the same as genetic counseling with some other genetic disorder. And the specialists have, as it were, constructed their discourse in order to fit over time the nature of the condition. Now you can't find that out like that. You can only find that out over an extensive period of joint problematization. The second one is already one I've referred to, this notion of recontextualizing and recategorizing, how you harmonize the discourse of discourse analysis with the discourses of the workplace. Let me tell you a story. There was a Greek, actually, a Greek GP trainer, George, working in one of this GP training outfit in Western Sydney. And I was talking to George, and I was saying, well, tell me a little bit about what you do, George, with the doctors that you're training. He said, well, what I do, he said, I try to teach them to walk with the patient. Uh -huh. I try to teach them to walk with the patient. I said, well, that's interesting. Great. What do you mean? And he said, well, you know, walk with the patient. I said, well, tell me what that means. Well, it means what it means is getting so close to the patient in terms of understanding the background of that patient that I can go with them and talk to them in language that they understand about circumstances which we now share. And I do that by my communicative competence and my expertise. That's walking with the patient. Now, if I picked up a book on conversation analysis or something, it wouldn't be called walking with the patient. It would be called something like alignment or whatever it might be. And there are ways in which that's done. And George knows that because that's what he wants to engender in his particular trainees. But he gives it a metaphorical, and a metaphorical construct, walking with the patient. And finally, this notion of reflexivity, which is understanding the subjective processes that are going on in any kind of organization where we're aiming at um, system change. Now, the final section, I'll be talking for about another 10 minutes and then I'll finish. The third section is what I'm going to call strategy, which quite simply is what can we do about it? What are we going to do about it? How can we turn it into action? How can we turn it into practical action? And I think one of the things that we can do is to look at the notion of case studies. Now, it's very interesting. If you look in business, if you look in law, if you look in marketing, if you look in a variety of social work, a variety of different professional areas, case studies are central to how they go about the processes of training and development. In language teaching and learning, on the other hand, case studies have not, generally speaking, been a central factor in how one organizes one's kind of practical work. So I'm suggesting that what we need to do in applied linguistics in all areas is to contemplate the idea that case studies can be part and central part of our professional repertoire and our professional training um, curriculum. And in, that, in doing that, we would, as it were, be able to strike a chord with people from a variety of different domains for whom case studies are a central practice in what they do. They do this because they know that participants, young apprentices or people training or people entering the profession, they're socialized into this particular community of practice through the engagement directly or vicariously in particular cases. Cases become the basis of professional judgment and decision making for present and future cases. We don't necessarily label them like that, but when we have a new event or a new environment or a new kind of context of action in schooling or whatever it is, and we try to understand that, we understand it by referring to previous experiences of like events, if you like, which constitute, however informally, cases, which then, of course, can be formalized and inserted into curricula as 
a particular set of cases that people have to learn to work with and accommodate to in their professional development. And the great thing about cases is that they always involve you in applying general and ab abstract knowledge to particular cases. So a particular case is understood in relation to some general and abstract knowledge, for example, risk or trust or engagement, involvement, whatever it might be. Okay. <clears throat> How do you go about working with cases? Well, I think what you do first of all is you model the discourses of typical cases. Now, of course, everybody will vary in what they regard as being typical or not typical. But let's assume that we have a body of teachers who are involved in language teaching or any other kind of teaching, or we have a body of police persons or health workers or accountants, whatever it is, and we bring them together. And what we say to them is, I want you to try and indicate to us some typical cases and how the discourse operates in those particular cases. And we set that up. We, we do that in workshopping, you know, with, with butcher's paper and stuff like that. And then we say, okay, now I want you to think of contrary cases. I want to think of cases which are different to those typical cases. Or cases which are related to them but not quite the same. Or cases which are rather borderline as between, let's say, the world of teaching and the world of, um, of um, counselling. At the moment, as you may well be aware, there is a kind of tension going on between teaching and advising. If you go into language teaching and learning environments and ask people, oh, you're a language teacher. They go, oh, no, 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 I'm an advisor. And so language advising is a kind of world of its own now, and it's very strong. I mean, a colleague of mine in Japan has just put together a whole series of papers, and I, I wrote one of the chapters on the language of advising, and she's firmly believed, and I believe that she believes, that advising is different from teaching. And if I say to her, excuse me, some teachers would say they were advisors, and some advisors, when I look at what they do, seem to be teaching. Oh, no, no. So what you've got then is borderline cases, which seem to be partly one profession, partly one another, but what they do is to raise the issues of how one could define these particular case-like environments. And then, of course, we can look at them through a particular lens. We can say, look, let's have a look at this case. Would you say that this case was a risky case or a not-so-risky case? Or would you say that this case was essentially a trust-bearing case or a not-trust-bearing case? And you don't have to choose risk and trust. You can choose other kinds of themes. Now, okay. Now, within these cases, what can we do next? Well, what we can do, and I talked about this before, is we can try to identify case-specific focal themes. These focal themes, then, are in the air. When I was a graduate student in the United States and I took courses from the great sociolinguist Bill Lebov, it was the first time he'd been teaching sociolinguistics, and we said, he said, I want you to look at phonetic variation, you know, and we were in Venice, California, you know, very surfy. And uh, he sa we said, well, excuse me, excuse me, uh, how do we know what these variables are? And Bill Lebov said, sniff them out. I said, oh, thank you. That's really helpful. Sniff them out. So, you know, we all went round. It was a summer school. We all went round Venice, California, sniffing out variables. But in a way, of course, it was, we regarded it with a slightly kind of, who is this guy? But in fact, it was a very interesting exercise because we discovered that there were certain variables which in Lebovian terms were markers of particular identity. Use this variable in this way. It marks you as having this identity. I lived in Lancaster. I was in chair of linguistics at Lancaster for a long time. But in Lancaster, I know particularly well that there is a palatalized T. And if I say I'm going up Moor, I'm going up to the hospital, I know exactly that guy comes from Lancaster. That's a marker. I got my students once to do a phonological study of a housing estate. This housing estate was full of people who had moved from rather less commodious accommodation to live in this housing estate. 
They were the urban rising middle class, you know, the kind of people. They had patios, you know, hibiscus flowers. They bought Fort Cortinas, you know, that went to the Costa Brava, that kind of thing. And so when you went there and talked to them and listened to their language, what had happened was that they had, as it were, abandoned the Lebovian markers of their previous lower class, quote unquote, urban environment and taken on this kind of phonology of the middle class. But what they'd done, of course, is taken on an exaggerated form of the middle class phonology. So they said things like, honestly, because <laughs> they'd been taught never to drop your H's, right? So they added them, you know, massively. So you had all these people walking around these patios saying, honestly. Right? <laughs> now, a friend of mine was a political scientist. He said, I bet you, he said, I can guarantee what the political voting behavior will be of this housing estate. And the Labour Party failed to do that at one crucial election. And what happened was they moved from the working class suburbs where they'd all voted Labour and they went into this wonderful environment with the Fort Cortina, patios and honestly, and they all voted Conservative. Of course, could be expected. And I had my undergraduate students running around this uh, housing estate with recording, you know. But it was quite fascinating. Marker after marker after marker in Lebovian terms came up, as it were, as being characteristic. Okay, now... One of the focal themes that goes across now a range of professions is professional neutralism and non-directiveness. In other words, that the professional shouldn't engage herself in a kind of active position, but rather to adopt a more neutral, a non-directive kind of stance, if you like. Rapport and empathy are characteristic focal themes. In Britain, when I lived there before I moved, thank God, to Australia, then what happened was that you went into banks and banks declared themselves to be the listening bank. <laughs> They're big labels, the listening bank. And then they had people who didn't wear suits anymore, they wore cardigans. And then they had big notices here saying, my name is Fred. <laughs> and then the bank was changed, so it didn't have a bench, it, has, it had easy chairs. The whole thing looked like a kind of club and people had to accommodate that. And the language changed. It was like, can I serve you? Is there anything I can do for you? You sure there's nothing you can do? Help you? And the whole interaction became one of a kind of, I don't know, some sort of vague counseling environment, people by people in, populated by people in cardigans with their name on it, and they were all listening furiously. And so what happened is, as it were, a whole dimension of rapport and empathy. But seriously, if you want to be accredited as a general practitioner in Australia, you migrate to Australia. Let's imagine you're qualified as a doctor in Greece. You want to come to Australia, you have to go through various licensing examinations. We've done a big study of this. What happens is that on the licensing environment in the test, it says rapport, tick, tick. So the doctor has somehow to show rapport. Well, what is rapport? Well, you know what rapport is. Everybody knows what rapport is. But the point is that you can be ticked or not ticked for rapport, but there's no real definition of what rapport is. Yet rapport is something to do with communication. Empathy is even more difficult. So what we have then is a series of focal themes which are communicative-based, communication-based, shared in the community. Joint decision-making. <coughs> That's a real focal theme. In our workshop, in our school, in our clinic, we, as it were, make decisions together. Of course, this is rubbish. That we don't actually make decisions together because there is always somebody in control. So what we have is a kind of semblance, but not an actuality. Take management of competing discourses. Let's imagine that you're a care provider. Are you actually governed by a focal theme of care, or are you governed by a focal theme of profit? If you're a private care provider, you've got a, a real schizophrenic problem. Because on the one hand, you've signed up to be a care environment, but on the other hand, you're taking money. So how do you manage? Well, you say, oh, we manage. But then there's a crucial moment. A crucial moment comes when a person is deserving of care and in your portfolio to be cared for. 
but they can't afford the money. Then you have a real shift in the discourse. Because a caring discourse is a discourse which is a discourse of sharing, a discourse of collaboration, a discourse of taking account of the other, where the profit, as it were, discourse is a very different kind of discourse. It has to do with exchange of goods and the value that's been placed, uh, placed upon them. So we have a number of focal themes that we need to identify. Now, the trick then, and this is coming towards the end of what I want to say, the trick in practice, the strategy, is how can we align focal themes with analytic themes? What are the analytic themes? Well, broadly speaking, there's a bunch of analytic themes which have to do with, broadly speaking, let's say, a linguistic environment, speech act pragmatics, lexicogrammatical formulations, and so on. There's a rhetorical world having to do with reasoning, argument, narrative, tropes, that's to say, ways of... Um, talking about things. And there's an interactional world having to do with turn design and identity work. And so the analytic themes fall into those general categories. But those are general categories. How do we get more specific? How do we get down to the level of the analysis? Well, here are some candidate analytic themes. Articulating indirect speech acts, constructing hedges, recycling mutually known events, which both people know, as it were. This relates to the focal theme of non-directiveness and professional neutralism. What I'm saying is that in order to, in order to sustain this idea of neutralism and lack of directiveness, if you like, we have recourse to a, a, a kind of repertoire of analytic themes. And this repertoire of analytic themes is partly linguistic, partly rhetorical, and it's um, partly, as I said in the earlier slide, it's partly interactional. And we can narrow it down to these more specific analytical themes that we undertake. So let's imagine that we're talking to a patient or a school child or a parent or whatever it might be, we're anxious to maintain our professional neutralism. We're anxious not to be directive, keep things on a level playing field. How do we do that? Well, one of the ways in which we do that is to <coughs> shift, for example, questions about advice to mutual discussion. So if a patient asks us for advice, or a mother asks us for advice, or anyone else asks us for advice, that that extends, elaborates the power differential between the asker and the provider. So if Gabby asks me for advice, that immediately sets me in a more powerful position as far as Gabby is concerned. And I enter into the dangerous world of being directive as opposed to being non-directive. So how do I get round that? Well, I get round it by turning it on its head into a topic of mutual discussion. And I do that by otherizing our relationship to people that are not ourselves. And so I might say, well, that kind of question, you know, a lot of people ask that. Um, what do you think, you know, those people are trying to find out by asking that kind of question? In other words, it becomes a more mutual discussion which brings the playing field back to a much more level playing field where power, as it were, is less dominant as a result of the kinds of discourse. And we all have strategies of this kind. So those are candidate analytic themes. Now what data do we need in order to do that? I don't need to go through that entirely, but you can see that we have a range of data that we can draw upon. Documents and accounts, narratives, experimental work, expert appraisals and so on, semi-structured interviews, memory work, discourse studies of simulated and natural interaction, time-space theme analysis, that's to say what goes on within a particular space or a particular time. So what can be done within a classroom as a particular space is not what can be done in a playground or in some other kind of environment. So there's a whole key set of data and if there's a key set of data, then there's a key set of methodologies 
which need to be in our repertoire. We need to be able, as it were, to undertake ethnographic work, narrative analysis, ethnomethodological work in interpreting the methods that people use to make communication with each other, discourse, analysis, conversational analysis, and so on. A range of methodology which are in keeping with the kind of data sets that we have derived um, in the sites of engagement in which we work. I thought I'd put that up because I only just got it this afternoon. I couldn't resist it. This is a book on discourses of trust. Uh, this is not a marketing map. Well, I have to say that because I might sound like marketing. But I thought I might end with this because we couldn't resist the trapeze artists as a kind of image of trust. You know. so trust is somewhere you know, in between these two hands. You know. The point, of course, of it is that trust is always interpretable through the kinds of discourses of the participant. And trust is always something you want to build as a hedge against risk. Okay, thanks very much. <coughs> If you want to get in touch with um, me about anything, or even the handouts and uh, overheads, you can reach me on that particular email address, and I would be glad to uh, um, hear from you. Well, you've been very trusting, <laughs> very risky, actually. Although I suppose this environment is less risky than some I could think of. But anyway, I'm grateful to you for your trust. If you have any questions, Fine. If people, of course, it's a bit late, and if you want to go, you know, don't feel embarrassed. Just go. But if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try and respond. <coughs> okay. Well, thanks very much.